Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me today. My guest today is Tim Hicks, and he's the author of Last Stop Before Tomorrow. And this is a novel which talks about the environment and a lot of the complex issues surrounding different perspectives. Um, it's a wonderful book. I've just finished it, and I'd like you to talk about it with us today. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, good, good to be with you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm curious, what was the main idea when you were thinking of writing this book? What was the inspiration? I'm going to sit down and write this book. Yeah. To tell you the truth, I wasn't intending to write a novel. I had been trying to write about climate change uh, in a nonfiction mode for really maybe three or four years and just wasn't able to find the voice that satisfied me. Um, I was really interested in how we relate to climate change, how we look at climate change, how we kind of place climate change in our understanding of ourselves as a species, as uh, you know, how climate change fits into the story of our history on the planet. And um, so it was grappling with those kinds of thoughts that then one day I sat down, kind of frustrated at not being able to write in the, in the nonfiction mode, and, and actually started writing this for the first section of the book uh, without intending to write a novel. I just sat down, started writing, this thing came out, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, what's that? Mm. And uh, next day he came and wrote the second section, and then the third section, and then I realized, wow, I'm writing an awful about this. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Great. And it kind of unfolded as I went along. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm curious, so it's, we see a lot of uh, nonfiction work about climate change, facts and figures, um, and the, the fiction approach, writing it as a novel with characters, do you think that is more approachable, or is that, do you think, a better strategy for bringing these ideas to people? Yeah, not necessarily better, but different. You know, it's, it's interesting how you can do different things with nonfiction writing, different things with novel writing, different things with poetry, that each, each mode has uh, an ability to speak in different ways. Um, and so it allowed me to kind of play around with the kind of the concepts of, for instance, uh, you know, a big theme, as you saw when you read the book, is our relationship with technology and so that kind of dance between humans and technology and creativity and um, our inquisitiveness and um, kind of the dual nature of technology having all of its promise but all of its mm -hmm. dangers and challenges uh, the fiction mode allowed me to play around those ideas in a different way than than the demands of nonfiction mm -hmm. yeah Great. It is more poetic, it's more artistic, it's more thoughtful in a way, feeling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's what I enjoyed when I was reading your book, is, is that there was a real obvious sense that you know what you're talking about. You have facts and figures and a lot of research. Uh, it's rich with information and statistics and so forth. <laughs> But at the same time, you're on this adventure with these characters and their interpersonal relationships. And so it, it's a nice kind of pace where you get some breathing room to you know, absorb and learn and then to kind of be carried along with the story. Mm -hmm. And um, I, thought, I thought the format worked really well and it was fun. It was a new way to look at it. Cool, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to, one of the things I wanted to do once I got into it and realized what I was doing is convey the sense of... Uh, of the long arc of human history, really going back 50,000 years, mm -hmm. recognizing that we came out of the caves and that this story now where we're at is connected to that beginning mm -hmm. and that history has been this adventure and also this way of coping with being on this planet in the mystery of the universe with the threats to our survival and that you know technology is really both an expression of our creativity and our, the wondrous you know of our of our inventiveness but also has been part of our effort to survive here mm. and uh, so I, I don't know if you remember that scene of Marianne painting mm. a picture that came from the diorama at the best um, uh, Museum of Technology, and she's painting these figures of this, you know, cave couple mm. beside the fire, mm. and with their two children, one at the breast, and suckling at the breast, and one at her knee, and mm. and Marianne asking, could we not have developed all this technology, and 
you know, would it have been appropriate to have not gone the direction we've gone? Mm -hmm. uh, could you look in the eyes of those cave people and say, no, you can't have all the comforts that we have? Mm -hmm. And yet it's those comforts that have produced climate change. So right. it's this ambivalent relationship to... Right. That's what I liked about the book also is that it, it wasn't necessarily saying this is right and this is wrong, but it was a chance for these characters to explore the complexities, yeah. you know, and to say there is no easy answer to this. Yeah. And, um, and I think for me, you know, it almost left me with more questions than answers, but in, in a more informed way. And I, I don't know if that's what you were aiming for. Yeah, I and mean, I remember really being struck and, and bothered by the fact that, um, you know, people would talk, it, 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 as we dealt with, as we looked at our impact on the planet, both climate change and just impact on species and habitat and all the rest of it, um, the, the phrase, uh, you know, humanity's a, a cancer on the face of the earth and, you know, better that the species just went away and it's understandable why mm. people can feel that way because we are so destructive in our power. But it didn't feel like a very compassionate mm -hmm. way of looking at ourselves. It didn't look, it didn't seem to embrace a kind of broader understanding of what this story has been. And so I, I did really want to present the nuances of, of this situation that we're in and to not look at, not look at it as black or white, good and bad, mm -hmm. right, wrong, but really this is a complex story and it's not so easy to be here and that the story is still unfolding, you know, that the behaviors that have led to climate change go all the way back to when we first started messing with fire mm -hmm. and that um, I like to, t you know, remind people that the early potter, pottery industry mm -hmm. uh, is not that different from coal-fired power plants now. They're both about messing with thermodynamics and transmuting, you know, matter into energy for comfort and for safety and security, and and um, it's kind of all one long narrative, mm -hmm. and we're in the midst of that, and we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we, mm -hmm. how do we take the next step in our consciousness development, really. I, uh, I, um, I know that you are uh, a writer by night, and by day you're a mediator slash facilitator. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me more about that type of work? Yeah, you know, conflict resolution has to do with how people engage with each other. Um, and uh, the, the problems that we face with climate change and, you know, relate to the problems we face with social decision making and how we how we live together and how we um, deal with the unavoidable conflicts that come up that are part of social re relating. Um, so my work has to do with both thinking about and writing about but also in practice helping people um, improve their communication uh, when they run up against differences that are getting in the way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we live in a world of diversity and difference and uh, there's no way to avoid the conflicts as we come up against each other and we have to negotiate those and often it's helpful to have a third party help people navigate that, that yeah. thicket of conflict. I think it's really relevant, and, and it, I thought of that as as you were writing because, um, you know, as as we're looking at these characters, it almost allows us to become that third party, you know, to look mm -hmm. at here's mm -hmm. this guy who has, you know, he's a scientist and he has interest in his company doing well as a oil producing um, service providing company at the same time that's causing so much destruction and what a dilemma he's in, and to look at it from this perspective and then here's all these people involved, um, do you think adopting the, the, the narrative um, allows us to, to look as that mediator perhaps of these issues? Yeah, I mean I think you know, one look, way of looking at, at life is through stories mm -hmm. and that um, you know, we live in our stories of what the world is and what meaning is and uh, when we meet each other in conflict, we each have our stories about what's going on, what's real and true and good mm -hmm. and beautiful and right. And, um, and so in the fiction world, we're working with story mm -hmm. 
And, and I guess, you know, one of the things about fiction is that the reader, as you're suggesting, kind of has that, the benefit of kind of watching the story unfold and thinking and feeling how they relate to that story mm-hmm. and what it means to them. Um, so in a way, it's all about stories, and what, mm-hmm. and I think that that you know, going back to that uh, idea of we're a cancer on the face of the earth. That's one story. That's one right. telling of what we think is going on, mm-hmm. but it's not maybe the most helpful or therapeutic story. Um, that you know, and and uh, you know, in each our own lives as we're unfolding, what story we tell about ourselves, who we are, and. The story of our lives and the meaning of our lives and our parents and our family life and 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 our quest to find whatever it is we want to find. That storytelling is really important in terms of then how that will influence how our how our behavior will, mm-hmm. how we will behave in the world, how we will be with others, and how we will be with ourselves, and what choices we'll make. So, mm. yeah. It does seem like, you know, especially around the topic like climate change, it seems like there's these polarities. You know, there's people often have fixed positions and they're often uh, viciously opposing the others. You know, and it's the protesters versus the loggers or it's, you know, whatever these dichotomies are. And um, what would you say to somebody who feels like they are completely right about this situation and how can they perhaps soften their resistance or, or find peace within their perspective yet not give up on their ideals. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's one of the central questions around uh, or embedded in this field of conflict resolution that you know how do we deal with these um, strong positions as you say and so there's techniques. I mean one of the things that is true I think is that these beliefs that we have, these stories that we have, these pictures we have of what's true and right and good are intimately involved with our identity, with who we think we are and what we think is true. So one of the first steps that has to happen is to create space for the legitimacy of each of those perspectives. In other words, we often come at each other in opposition, as you were suggesting, and as long as you're opposing me, I have to defend. Mm-hmm. And so we just, we're in this kind of battle of who's going to win, who's going to lose. And so the first step is really saying, okay, let's put down those weapons mm-hmm. and create a space in which it's safe and okay for you to believe what you believe, even though it might be really different than what I believe. Mm-hmm. And vice versa, that my perspective is legitimate and real. And, and so that, that's creating that space where we can accept that other people have a different belief system than we do mm-hmm. and it's okay mm-hmm. and to honor that and then once that's if we can create that space and safety then we can begin to be together and mm-hmm. say okay what do we do with these differences mm-hmm. uh, because until we're willing to put down the weapons uh, the swords and the shields, we're not going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so that is the first step, I think, to say it's not about right and wrong, it's not about winning and losing, it's about the recognition that we do have different experiences of what the world is and begin there and then negotiate how can we live together mm-hmm. in a way that... And then we have to make decisions and sometimes we can come to agreement and sometimes we can't, and then we have to revert to what's called the rights-based, you know, courts and rules and laws. Mm-hmm. But um, that that often we don't have the benefit of a rule when we're in disagreement with each other or law. We just have to say, okay, how are we going to live together in peace? Right. And and it's the big, you know, it seems to me the big question of humanity generally when we look around the world and what's happening in Syria and everywhere in a lot of other places. You know, this battle of right and wrong and good and bad and who's going to control and who's going to, what story is going to prevail mm-hmm. rather than co-creating a story. Um, and I think, you know, one way of looking at human history is that that is our quest to figure out how to live together uh, more harmoniously, how to manage the conflicts that are going to happen that are an outgrowth of the natural diversity of the world. Mm, right. In, in your work and training as a, as a mediator and facilitator, I'm sure you, you see this, you know, day in and day out, um, these, you know, perhaps personal conflicts and then recognizing it on a, a larger scale and a global scale. 
Are there any strategies or practices or specific exercises, something people could do to have that shift from a me versus you to a, perhaps a more balanced relationship? Yeah. Well, the first one is for people, as I was saying, just to recognize it's okay to have differences and, that, and to legitimize and validate and honor uh, the fact that we each are different. Um, and just to start that, that's number one, you know, that, uh, and, and bringing that to consciousness and really making that real, whether it's, you know, gender differences or ethnic differences or just differences in diet or whatever it is, that it's okay for you to be a meat eater if I'm a vegetarian, that, that, that I don't judge you for that. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And then, number, you know, number, there's a lot of different techniques. For instance, you know, you mentioned the, the word positions. We get very positional. Mm -hmm. And um, in the conflict resolution field, we often talk about the difference between positions and interests. Uh -huh. uh, and we often face each other with our positions without recognizing, without paying attention to really what's important to us. So, you know, an example, parents and their teenager who is saying, oh, I'm going to a party on Friday night and I won't be back later than 2 a.m. and the parents are saying, you won't be back later than midnight. Mm -hmm. So those are their positions. Okay. But if they looked at their interests, the parents have interest in the child's safety, uh -huh. that they know where the child is, that they know that the child is not going to um, be so wasted from the, from the party that they won't be able to do their homework. Those are their interests. Mm -hmm. And the kid might have interests in being respected, being trusted, you know, demonstrating that he or she is, you know, more grown up and can take care of themselves and be responsible. So the positions aren't that important, even though they're fighting over them. Interesting. But to kind of go back to what's really important to us here. Right. Yeah. That's that's an interesting point, and and I I think that might be one of the hardest things is that two people are talking about, like you said, their positions when actually what's underneath it could be a, a completely different story. And as long as these these positions are here. There's no end, right? That's right. Um, one, one of the, somebody's going to lose. Yeah. If we, yeah. Um, and and so, is it worth? Um, what are some strategies for perhaps being better at it, recognizing our own interests, recognizing and expressing that we understand the interests of the other person? Yeah. Well, you know, we just all we have is our communication, and, and the communication is through words through body language, mm. uh, through our actions, our physical behavior. And so if each person can take responsibility for being part of the solution rather than being part of the problem, then that leads to kind of more peaceful bodily behavior, in, mm. you know, and more peaceful um, uh, verbal, you know. So if there's a conflict, to say to the other person things like, I know we're in conflict here. Mm. My relationship with you is important. I'd really like to try and resolve this. And uh, can we make a space for that? Can we, you know, kind of reaching out? Um, and even if the other person is so angry and says no, uh, then thinking about well, what is it that they need, that they might need to be able to say yes, to trust, to build trust. Um, so it's, you know, there's just a lot of different strategies depending on the situation, but, um, but that kind of reaching out and putting as much attention, you know, one of the things we talk about is I have my interests and I want to achieve those, right? I have my goals. And, and those self-interests are, are real. Um, just thinking about it in a self-interested way, if I want to get my needs met, the best thing I can do is attend to your needs and get your needs met. Because if you feel like your needs are met, you're going to be more willing to then maybe consider my needs. But if I'm just thinking about my needs, then we're back into that battle. Right. Yeah. The enlightened self-interest. Right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I was reminded of a story that my yoga teacher told me about her position uh, as an activist and they were trying to save the Brighton Bush uh, retreat center area from being logged and they were chaining themselves to trees and they were just in these, this bitter conflict with the loggers and the activists and it sounds like they had very different positions and she shared a, a big uh, moment for her was when she realized 
the interest in the loggers and that they were really just looking at providing for their families. To them, it was a livelihood. Without it, they, they would be homeless. Yeah. And, uh, and, and at that moment when her position shifted to one of awareness of, her, of their common interests, that they both have the same interests, um, a lot of that resentment went away and they were actually able to resolve and come to a, a more peaceful resolution because of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we so easily demonize the other side when they're different. That's a, kind of a, a typical uh, response pattern. And then, as you say, you know, if, even if the interests aren't the same, what we want to do is create solutions that address everybody's interest as much as possible. I mean, one solution is just to kill everybody who you don't agree with, and and then we're done. Yeah, okay, kill all the loggers. Well, no, no. Kill all the environmentalists. No. Um, how can we live together? That's the question. It's the, it's the same question in families, you know, in our personal relationships, in our social life, and internationally. The goal on this planet is to somehow live together more harmoniously. It doesn't mean there won't be differences. It doesn't mean there won't be conflicts. But to not have violent solutions or the abuse of power. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, in the forest, in that example, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work being done in Oregon with what are called forest collaboratives that bring together the industry folks and the environmental folks and the government agencies who are, have responsibilities and communities and you know economic development people and chambers of commerce and uh, to sit down and say, okay, well, here we are living on this part of the planet mm -hmm. and we've got our urban areas and we've got our rural areas and we've got our forest areas and we've got our resources and we've got fire issues that we have common interests in not wanting to have really massive fires. Mm -hmm. Um, we want to somehow manage this forest resource. Let's sit down together and talk through our differences and come up with solutions that address as optimally as possible all the interests that are around the table. Mm. Okay. What is your main uh, takeaway that you hope your reader will have after reading your book? That's a neat question, yeah. I mean, as you know, the and I, I don't want to give away the ending for people who haven't read the book, but... Uh, as you know, it ends in a certain way, and uh, it leaves some questions unanswered. Um, I think I want people to, as you were saying earlier, kind of get a, a different, maybe a different perspective on this question of climate change, and on the question of how, what do we do with our, uh, yeah, first of all, to see climate change in that broader perspective of human history unfolding. And then, um, how do we deal with the uh, different interests and pressures that, uh, and to recognize the challenge, to have some compassion for the challenge we face in changing our behavior on the planet. That, mm -hmm. you know, those behaviors have a millennial history, and for us to shift is not so easy. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, I always equate the words in understanding and compassion, that true mm -hmm. understanding will bring compassion. And really what compassion is partly is understanding on some mm -hmm. level. And, um, mm -hmm. and that if we can have a, a better story of what's really happened that's led to this situation, then that might create more space for us to say, okay, well now what do we do? Mm -hmm. I like that, that uh, comparison of uh, uh, compassion and understanding as being equal. Uh, it, it, it makes me think of perhaps um, if, if we want greater understanding, perhaps we could cultivate greater compassion. Or if we want greater compassion, we could cultivate greater understanding. Yeah. They seem to be kind of two roads uh, meeting in the middle. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think when we really understand something, mm -hmm. um, we can't help but have compassion. You know, when we have really understand what has led somebody to a certain situation, mm -hmm. whether it's whether they've done a you know um, whether they've done something that we call bad or wrong, mm -hmm. uh, when we really understand the stories, what's led people to those acts that have let's say maybe put them in prison or they're on the street mm -hmm. or or when we've done something that we don't feel proud of, mm -hmm. um, we can criticize and judge. We know we do that really easily. Mm -hmm. um, but when we, if we really understand the story, then 
compassion will follow because yeah, it's just great. Yeah. I like that. I'm I'm curious because it seems like climate change is is uh, there's an analogy I've heard where it's like a, I don't know if this is true, but you put a frog in in water and you start boiling it and they don't realize it's getting hot until it's too late. Um, but I wonder when we're kids, you know, climate change doesn't mean anything, right? We 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 just live our life. We don't know that the world is changing. Um, and so at some point, and this may have happened to certain people, maybe it hasn't happened yet. Um, at what point in your life did you realize climate change is real, this is important, and I have to do something about it? Yeah, I think it's really hard to take in, even those of us who, even those who really recognize, oh my God, this is not, this is unprecedented, and it's um, both civilization threatening and life threatening on a major scale. You know, when you when you extrapolate what might happen in terms of system breakdown and tipping points in which climate shifts so dramatically beyond anything we've yet experienced, and in ways that threaten the viability of our living here, even when you're aware of that. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's sunny outside today. Mm -hmm. I have to take care of my issues today. I have to kind of feed myself and, f and feed those around me, and you know, figure out. I've got to get gas in the car, and you know, <laughs> got to get from here to there, and uh, make my living, and all of that stuff. Um, it's really hard to take in, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that that's part of the process that we're involved in as a species. Uh, because around the world, when you look at what people are struggling with just to survive, um, how to do that, take care of that, and really take responsibility for this apparent reality that we can either ignore, forget about, or question, mm -hmm. because, hey, things seem to be okay, right. it's really a challenge. Yeah. It's really a challenge. How about for you personally? Was there a moment? Was there a teacher? A movie? Was there some light bulb moment where you just realized this is? No, it's been a process. Yeah, okay. that. I mean, I remember reading early on uh, and hearing the term. You know, I probably heard the term first in the maybe early '80s, maybe the late '70s. Um, didn't really take it that seriously, but it was kind of sounded interesting. And then began to read, because I was very interested in kind of environmental and sustainability issues and the impact on the planet, and I was aware that we were making an impla impact. Um, and my entrance into, in, into conflict resolution world was through my uh, environmental interests. But it was, a, you know, it was a long process of kind of a deepening recognition of, holy shit, excuse the expression, holy shit, yeah. this is bigger than I had realized, and each kind of detail about, you know, methane release, permafrost, um, the loss of the reflective ice sheet, um, uh, the threat to the um, ocean currents, um, uh, just added to this kind of developing picture, the developing story, developing understanding of how significant it was, and then also then paired with that, the developing understanding of how hard it is to make change. How do we change our systems? You know, how can we? Will solar and wind be enough? And and the different, you know, the science was never clear in this sense that some people were saying, if we focus on solar and wind and renewables now, we can do it, and other people saying, no, solar. And when won't be enough, we have to come up with, you know, fusion technology or what's true, what's real, what can we, what, what information can we trust and depend on as we um, try and understand the, the reality, so-called, the physical reality, the mind-independent reality of what's really going on. Right. Which is, you know, interestingly, what living organisms do generally, we have to, through whatever perceptual senses we have, and we only have five, um, figure out 
what our environment is so that we can navigate in it. And that's what we're doing with climate change. We're trying to figure out what's really happening, what are the parameters, how much time do we have, how bad is it, um, so that we can respond, hopefully, to promote our survival. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of research and, and you've been, as you said, interested and, and uh, engaged in this subject for decades. Um, what would you say is something that the everyday person can do, who's busy, who has kids, who has to get their things done? If there's only one action that you could take, what would you say that would be? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think for one thing, everybody has to answer that question for themselves and it'll be different. Um, you know, I have, I have friends who, you know, I'm thinking of a biologist friend of mine who is so conscious of environmental impact and lives a very um, attentive life to these issues and mostly rides his bike everywhere, doesn't, you know, his car sits in his driveway most of the time, mm -hmm. uh, rain or shine. Um, but he flies to conferences all over the world <laughs> uh, as part of his work. Um, so everybody has to answer that question themselves. The one thing that, you know, I think I would encourage is um, kind of just attention to the subject, attention to the question, attention to what it feels like for them, what comes up, the fears, the 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 sadness, um, the feeling of maybe helplessness, hopelessness, um, or the feeling of challenge of, hey, we can do this, whatever whatever comes up, and I think conversation, you know, uh, keep talking with people about it, it's helping other people think about how they relate to it and how they feel about it, because in the end, it's going to be a shift in what we, you know, consciousness. It's going to be a shift in, in, um, in our ideas, our, in our stories. And so, I think keeping those questions on the surface and not being in a state of denial uh, is as important or more important than kind of individual behaviors, whether you buy a Prius or, you know, um, walk to the store or drive your car to the store. Those things are not insignificant, but they're not the most important thing. And it's at the regulatory group level that we're going to have to make some rules uh, if, if we're going to make, you know, turn the corner. It's going to be group action in terms of changing industry and changing in large behavior. So, yeah, there is this, you know, like, local global thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that every individual action doesn't contribute. It does. Um, but it's not sufficient, and that what each of us can do, I think, is just raise the level of awareness. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I can see that in, in myself, too. It's, it's interesting how I think it's easy once we get in, in a, a mode like uh, we've got to save the environment, and then you can become either very um, hypervigilant and uh, you can't take a hot shower anymore without feeling guilty that you're wasting too much water or heat, or you know, every time you, you say you drive, you're feeling guilty or you're feeling uh, bad and, and it almost seems like you're sh maybe we're shooting ourselves in the foot by being hyper vigilant and not, not enjoying life at all and, and perhaps even causing illness in ourselves by being so stressed out so yeah. it, seems, it seems to be a yeah. tricky balance to strike <laughs> yeah yeah I know yeah there is uh, there's the, you know the surrender, serenity prayer comes up uh, and also, um, you know, there's a phrase that I think I might use in the book, but it's a phrase that came to me qu quite a while ago, of, you know, the question of how much we tell the story and how much we're told by the story, how much we, how much the unfolding story is the result of our agency and control and how much we're just part of this unfolding story Interesting. and there's some balance in that uh, we both have agency it's it's uh, and, and we and we don't have control and so you kind of got to do what you can do but you got to be okay with this flow mm -hmm. and it's kind of like with mortality individual mortality you know you've got to just 
keep breathing and, and uh, try and make good choices and um, yeah. I see. Yeah, that, I like that a lot. The uh, the serenity pair, I think, that wisdom to know the difference, I think that's, yeah. that's a fantastic piece yeah. of advice to yeah. remind ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what, what is next? Are you planning to write a new book after this? Or are you taking a break? Well, I'm working on a book right now that is um, nonfiction, which I really want to get done, and it's a challenge. Um, and uh, it has to do with um, the relationship of our neural function to conflict, um, and uh, trying to better understand both why we get in conflict based on the realities of our neural function as living organisms, as human beings. So I want to get that done, and um, and uh, and then I'd like to write another novel. I'd like to approach some of these sub subjects in a fiction way, but I don't yet consider myself a, a novelist. You know, I've written one novel. Um, more of my writing has been in the nonfiction realm. So, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a bit of an adventure of well, gee, what would it be like to write the second one? Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I definitely have it on, and I've taken a run at uh, starting a number of uh, a number of efforts to starting the next novel, and none of them have quite got traction. Um, so I think it's again what we were just saying, and kind of uh, kind of going with it and not forcing it, and uh, kind of being patient and seeing what comes up. And, and I do know that I kind of want to get this other book out. Yeah. Um, that sounds fascinating, the neurobiology of conflict and conflict yeah. resolution. That yeah. ought to yeah. be another conversation. Cool. Well, I'd like to talk to you about that too. And, um, Great, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. This has been a real pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure too. Uh, thank you for sharing your work and for sharing your ideas, for doing the heavy lifting of the research and the uh, amazing uh, perspective you've provided uh, for your readers to look at these situations from the perspective of somebody as a scientist, as a business person, as a, a bystander. Um, it was very helpful for me to see it from these perspectives and um, I really appreciate your work. Cool. Yeah, we should, uh, should, I'd like to mention that um, if people are interested, uh, laststopbeforetomorrow.com, they can go there and kind of see yes. a little bit about the book. and yeah. Perfect. And also, your book is available on Amazon? Yeah, it's available everywhere. Amazon, uh, uh, Barnes & Noble, you can ask your local bookstore to get it. They can get it from their distributor and, and uh, ebook and, and paper. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, again, thank you so much for your time and for yeah. sharing your great yeah. words with us. Great. It's a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So, again, if you'd like to buy the book, it's uh, Last Stop Before Tomorrow and it is on Amazon. You can go to laststopbeforetomorrow.com and pick up a paperback or a Kindle edition. Thank you so much, and we'll see you all next time.